a very uh, words of thanks and gratitude to this institution, Dr. Nagar in particular. Uh, I can see that you are all very well prepared with criticism and you all know the definition of criticism. You have a definite textbook of criticism. I, I can see you there. I, I, I was wondering uh, if you already know this much. Uh, um, what, what more? I, I, I know you have two very competent and capable people teaching you. So uh, I know that these are not, not just show pieces. These are things that you have done knowingly. You know, and therefore you produce the work. So what, what more can I add to that within the time span that we have together? What more can, can we add to that? I uh, have been teaching criticism for quite some time now and in the process of, of uh, 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 interacting with students, I had mostly master's level students, in the process of interacting with students, certain points develop on their own and uh, the only credit I take for the handout that I have given you today is the design of the handout. All the points, they are already there. So many thinkers have thought about them. But to arrange them in a diagrammatic form, format is all the little credit that I can take. You will find that at the very center, there is our focus, that is literature. And as very interestingly, very, very importantly, Scott James mentions, that suppose you have a problem with this fan, you have to call an electrician, one who knows, right? You have a problem with plantation of trees, you have to call a gardener. You want to serve refreshment, you must have a chef or a cook. You want to set right this bench, you must call a carpenter. But if you want to know about literature or a poem, you don't call a poet. You don't go to a poet to understand a poem. You go to a critic. You go to a teacher. A teacher like, like Plato and his, Plato used to write poetry by the way. He burnt and abandoned his own, own poems when he came into contact with his Guru Socrates. And I'll talk, talk about that a little bit. But Aristotle never created anything in the sense of creative work. He only opined. The fact of the matter is, or the moral of the story is, critics or teachers might not be creative writers. They, they could be, they might be, but they need not be. So what you just spoke about, the function of, or the definition of criticism, is very important as a starting point that you must know the distinction between creative writing and critical appreciation. Most of you are in your TY. Very soon you will do your graduation. What would be your degree? The degree will mention you have done a Bachelor of Arts in English. This bachelor that you get, the degree or even master's or even a PhD, does not require you even to compose the uh, item, for example. Please ponder over this point. When we come to study English or any Sahitya for that matter, any literature for that matter, we are not asked to create that literature. We are always asked to analyze the literature. Think of your questions in the examination. Write the character sketch of Nerebeck, so and so, so and so. Comment upon the theme of so and so, so and so, so and so. 
Why does Wordsworth speak on childhood and so on, so on, so on, so on, so on? Have you ever given a question like, My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky? Dot, 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 dash, 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 complete the poem in your own words. Have you given? No. There is a fundamental distinction between creativity and analysis. We all study analysis. There are very few creative writing schools, classes in the entire world. In India, a reasonably good attempt in creative writing is made with the igloo materials. But again, as I say, I, I have reservations because I have been fortunate to come into contact with a few other creative writing schools. Therefore, I can tell you that it's a very reasonable attempt at teaching creative writing. There is also the question, can you really teach creative writing or not? Can you really teach somebody to create or not? You can direct the creation. But unless and until there is some kind of a challenge from within, would it come up? It's a very old question, it's a debatable question. It is a, a very important question on which the neoclassical thinkers differ from or the, the romantic thinkers differ from the predecessors neoclassical thinkers. That's the fundamental question of the challenge within. Therefore, if you look at the center of our, can I have one uh, of this? So if we have, this is our focus, right? You can ask me, sir, in a classroom on criticism, why do you put criticism here? Why do you put literature here? Because literature is the stuff on which we critique. We, you cannot even ask me the question that which came first? And there is, there is a mention there in your score James. Did criticism come, come, come first or creative writing come first? It's a slightly difficult question but not really a question like the chicken and the egg. Real life or reality is always ahead of theorizing upon that reality. So in my mind there is no doubt that criticism followed creativity. Yes, you can ask me that or you can say that the first act of creation was itself a critical act. That's true. But again, as not only Scott James but later on T.S. Eliot would, would say, uh, William Empson would say that artists, creators are not supposed to think about the goal of the creative work of art. They are not supposed to, they, they need not, that is, on what is the end of that work of art. They only concentrate on that expression of that work of art. They bring it out. Right? And if you look historically, again, your, uh, you have it from your book, that Homer was at least 300 years before Socrates. Okay, the creative writer was 300 years before one of our earliest critics and commentators on life as well as on poetry. So here is our focus, literature. And then there are six arrows, right? Now, I would ask you to look upon it beginning with ontology clockwise. Clockwise. But I would say, and this is again something which probably our generation has taken from the, the avant garde, the experimentation of the modernists. I will not go clockwise, but I will ask you to look upon this, this diagram as made up of three axes A, X, E, X plural of A, X, I, S axis Okay When you look 
at ontology, go to the opposite axis. What is there? Description. Now, ontology, ontology is that branch of philosophy that ponders over what is the thing. Like you have, there was a chart on Wordsworth somewhere. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wordsworth. Right? Everybody remembers Wordsworth's definition. Remember the Mahira? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There is another thing in the same document which is equally important. What is that? Any guesses? We have not come to that. No, but that preference or that, that aspect. Huh? The, uh, small. I, 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 I. Even if, if I ask this question to my MS student today, when I was a student, I thought only that in the preference and definition is important. When I started teaching, you become a little more aware, you become a little more conscious, and you also become a little embarrassed that what were you doing as a student? So, uh, so uh, I, 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 I do not look back on my student days with nostalgia and fondness at all. But in that same document, Griffiths, Wordsworth gives another very, very significant uh, definition. He asks the question Language of poetry should be ordinary. Yeah, language, yes, but there is it. Again, you forget. I have taught you. So now you are teaching in a polytechnic and uh, you are very technical and therefore you can set right my mobile as you were trying to do but uh, definition slightly defies you. The other thing that Wordsworth asks in that preface is, please listen to this question, what is a poet? If somebody comes down the door right now, I will not ask, hey, what are you? Would I ask what are you? Who are you? Relatively, it is a very simple thing to answer the question, who are you? Who am I? My introduction was given. Because I got you know, my, my degree is from MS University, I said here. But, when on the 4th of this month, I contacted Professor Nagar and said, Sir, on 6th I might not be able to come with you two. The question that Professor Nagar asked, because he informed that he is already informed that I am going to come. He said, but will you come? I told you, I have, we have known each other for quite some time, but nowhere it is written on my body or on a document, on my body or, or with my document or anybody of yours, that such and such person is a dependable person. Right now when I was sitting in Sal's chamber, a girl came, two months late, and she said, who men are this? Sir asked a very pertinent question, you have missed two months of class. Apart from the fact that we, sir, relies on the words, there is no proof that this person is a hard working person, this person is a dependable person, this person is a responsible person. That is the whatness of a person which does not have any certificate. We give a bona fide certificate. To the best of my knowledge, so and so bears a good sound moral character. The sound moral character, how many times? What, what, is, the, what is the proof? Where is it written? Which document proves it? Wordsworth asks the question, what is a poet? Then Wordsworth realizes he is trapped in the question. He says, the, the poet is, he says, he, he means to say, it is implied that the poet does not descend from Mars. 
man talking to man. Yes. Then he goes on to say, the poet is slightly better than all others. So what is it ultimately when you read the definition? The poet is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a significant difference in degree. Poet is like any other human being. He has not jumped down from Mars. He is not an extraterrestrial person. He is like any other human being, but he is slightly more particular about details, slightly more particular about expression, medium, that thing about man speaking to men. In what diction? Understandable diction. So, slightly more in control with a medium of expression, language. Slightly more sensitive. Slightly more sensitive than other human beings. And he goes on to this and then he gives up and he says, ultimately he says, a poet has a more comprehensible soul. It's a very abstract thing. A poet has a more comprehensible soul. We all have souls. But our is supposed to be slightly less comprehensible. Its scope, yeah. Its scope is rather limited for ordinary human beings and it's very comprehensive. Then you understand that Kahawat in Hindi and other Indian languages. Jahana Pahunche Ravi, Vaha Pahunche Ravi. Kaise? Who can push? Pahunche. The proof is, testimony is, the Kavi Ki Kavita. So, ontology always asks the fundamental what questions. Ontology. Now the problem but with asking the what question is, you often cannot define. You can define uh, uh, what is, uh, say, electricity. So you will you will go with the definition that is given in physics. Or Einstein has this famous equation that E is equal to M C square. Or there is the definition of gravity. All those things are there. But what about as, as we discussed, is what is as Socrates asked, or as Socrates asked, but we do not know anything about him, apart from what we know from Plato. Plato says that Socrates was the best man, happiest person on earth, Plato said. But materially Socrates was very poor. Materially. Socrates was not at all happy. So what kind of happiness are we talking about? Is there a happiness meter that like uh, uh, that, that blood pressure belt that you wear and ching ching will come out and all those things will happen? No. So there are always things in this world like there are more things on this earth or ratio. There are always things in this world that science will never be able to completely know. There is, science is a wonderful stream, but science has its own limitations. And there, when you can't define something, you take the recourse to describing that thing. So therefore, the other point if you do not know what is the thing, what, in, the, in definitional terms, you can describe the thing. You can describe it. Description comes close to definition because description shows you the characteristics. There is such and such. So this is one axis. Criticism has always been concerned with fundamental questions, ontological questions, and questions of 
prescription. Then you go clockwise. Teleology. Again, slightly difficult word for you, but it means coming to a goal, to an end, outcome, or function, or what? If you remember, when we go with Plato as the first so-called critic, properly speaking, Plato never asked the question, what is poetry? Generally, philosophers are very concerned about the first question, the what question. But Plato never asked the what question. And that sets you thinking, why did he not? Why did he not ask the what question? Aristotle asked the what question. What is tragedy? And then he defined. If you are all prepared, I am not going to go there. What? But what I am trying to point you it out to you is the what question was not asked by Plato. What is the use of poetry? Is poetry of any use in his ideal republic or not? That is the question that he asked. So the end, if you if you know something of it, it is some use, then your psyche, your mind, your emotions is happy about it. Or when you know something is useless, you are unhappy about it or something. It, it affects the psyche. So the other axis is knowing something's function, knowing something's goal, knowing something's use makes you happy, unhappy, or stirs up your emotion. Correct? So, if you remember, there has always been a debate does literature entertain, bring happiness, give pleasure, or does literature teach, give morals? So in that sense then, what is the end product of literature? Preaching you, teaching you. But again, if every day you do literature only to learn morals, it would be a very boring thing. You must enjoy it. Therefore, the enjoyment, if you are drilled with morals every day, you are a sad person. You have the, those emoticons. Sad. And if you are start with, if you have started enjoying the class, if you have started enjoying what you are doing, and you are you have the, the other emoticons. It is always connected with what we feel because we are not only a thinking human being, we are also an emotional human being. So that is where Aristotle, in his definition at the end, what does he say? That it brings catharsis. Catharsis is something that you feel happening. When you say, Dil halka ho gaya. So can, can the statement be countered with the question, Kitna kilogram bhari tha? Dil halka ho gaya. Or when we say don't burden somebody with responsibility. Burden. What is the load of the burden? That great Greek figure, Atlas going around with a intact globe on his shoulder. Very, very symbolic. What is the burden? So in that sense then. We are always both. We are thinking human beings, we feel also, we are emoting human beings. So that aspect also has to be taken in taken care of. So that is the second axis. Function, use and teleology with the psyche or psychology. And the third is a very important aspect they also mentioned. To set the norms, to set the standards. I was having a very interesting 
small discussion with this student when she asked me a question that when any poet starts to write, when does the poet become aware of the form? So we discussed that a three-line poem can be a haiku, a three-line poem can be a tarzarima, a three-line poem can be a tarset in a very difficult type of poetry called villanelle. All three lines. But which three line is what? When you start writing, when you start, when you begin writing, and T.S. Eliot has a very good uh, statement, he said, any poet writing beyond his 25th year. He already begins, any poet writing beyond. Who, who does he have in mind? Keats. T.S. Eliot has Keats in mind because T.S. Eliot is puzzled. How does this young boy write poetry which, which the modern uh, mind in him does not like? All moderns hate the romantics. He doesn't like it. He, he says this, uh, uh, um, you know, beauty is to choose beauty. That is the only two two line problematic with that. Uh, that poem. Otherwise, it is a good poem. So he always has to find some fault with it. So the point is that are you aware of the technicality of what you are producing? When do you become aware of it? You don't become aware of it at the beginning. Even in language teaching, especially second language teaching, and you have language laboratories here, you know? The thumb rule is first let there be the language fluency. Then let us think of the right way and the wrong way, accuracy. English language teaching has a simple rule fluency before accuracy. What is accuracy? Accuracy means to know the rules, the norms the correct way, the incorrect way. And criticism must be judgmental. Criticism must say in the end what the thing is, whether it is agreeable. Like your uh, reviewers in newspapers or reviewers on FM radio, they give stars to movies. And then in the end say that you should go and watch or you should not go and watch Paisa Padigya and all those things. Right? They, they, they always, what is that? That's a recommendation, that's a judgment that they are passing. So when you have norms, normative, when you have norms, as I think, and then with the norms, you come to a very important function of criticism, appreciation. When you appreciate, you appreciate, you cannot appreciate a novel with the rules of a poem. You cannot appreciate a five-act play with the rules of a one-act play. Everything has to be done. What is said? Comparison can be done between comparables. You can compare a tomato with a cauliflower, and you cannot compare a tomato with a monkey because a monkey is a tomato. That, that is the no comparison. So, the moment you are thinking of how to analyze and to appreciate these things, look at what is said. Not said is a bracket. To appreciate also means to find faults. One of the important functions of criticism is to find where is the fault, where is the weakness. I give you a concrete example. Everybody must have watched three idiots. Yes. Ah, Very good. Now, in three years, and I have discussed this with my students. Great 
we, everybody, all these black minds are so emotional about it. And, and I say there is a central flaw in this movie. This movie is about education. Learning in a creative manner, right? Learning in a creative manner. There is no, not even a two minute sustained scene. How does Amit Khan learn in the creative manner? Only thing that we know is he goes and sits in any class that he gets. Very good. Very good. So many people can go and sit in any class that you get. You should watch a uh, 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 on YouTube, there is a speech by Steve Jobs, founder of Apple. Steve Jobs said that his adopted parents sent him to a very costly university and he did not like because of then he decided that he would drop out. When he dropped out, they realize that now I can attend whatever I like to attend. But is there any flashback in the movie three years of the young Amir Khan sitting in a class learning that the movie is about education and the movie doesn't say anything about education. It's a very flimsy way of telling. There is a song in which he rotates the play vessel or vessel and Patani kaise kaise. This is not the way to learn how, to, how the rotor works and how, how, you know, how to go about it. It is gliding over the thing. So, the point is that you, criticism, from the critical point of view, there is the fault. Otherwise, it's a very entertaining movie. It's a nice movie. Family can watch it. Very good. It is inspiring also. That character who gives up engineering goes for photography. It's a very inspiring movie. Follow your heart properly. That is also what Steve Jobs says in his uh, uh, speech, YouTube speech, given at Stanford University. Ironically, he dropped out of university and Stanford called him to address the graduation ceremony of, of the people. And you have rows and rows of students and people sitting listening to him in the uncomfortable sun there. And he says, he, he ironically mentions, this is as close I have come to getting recognized that I am educated because I have a drop out. This is as close as I have come. And he is addressing all the people who, uh, who are wearing their hats and gowns and things. So you need to know critically. If you are a student of criticism, you cannot simply say, ye achha hai, ye kharaab hai. You need to know, as I said, what is wrong, what is good. Kya achha hai, kya kharaab If you know that, then you are in the business of Appreciation, then you are the business of criticism. Now, when you go through the book, you will find that and it is it's, uh, very difficult to take you through a journey of this entire book, but you, in a nutshell, you have to summarize something. The, so, the centrality of the focus of criticism.